Welcome to this art history podcast. My name is Kristen Bell, and today I'm going to be discussing kente cloth. I'd like to begin our exploration of kente cloth, not in Africa, but in Washington, D.C. Teen Vogue and other news outlets reported on January 31st, 2018, that representatives of the Congressional Black Caucus who attended the State of the Union Address, instead of protesting with their absence, protested by wearing African kente cloth. The protest was specifically in response to Trump referring to Africa and Haiti as shithole countries. As Teen Vogue notes, kente cloth has been worn by black Americans in the 20th and 21st centuries to celebrate a pan-Africanist heritage, and is also used, as in this case, to protest things like racism. To understand the place of kente cloth in the U.S., it is helpful to take a look at not only the origins of kente, but also how it became a symbol of pan-African pride throughout the world. Let's now turn to Africa. First, we should situate ourselves in West Africa. To remind you where Ghana is, we will look at this map. Ghana is on the west coast of Africa and is tucked between Cote d'Ivoire on the west, Burkina Faso in the north, and Togo in the east. This is where our story will unfold. The story of Kente Cloth begins with a legend involving a spider. I actually found a wonderful children's book called The Spider Weaver, A Legend of Kente Cloth by Musgrove and Bulandi that sums up the story nicely with beautiful illustrations. You should really check it out. So, the whole story is a bit more involved than what my summary indicates, but essentially two male weavers named Nana Koragu and Nana Maya, who live in the Ashanti village of Von Wire in Ghana, go into the forest where they find a spider who has woven a magnificent web. They try to take the web back with them, but it breaks. They return to the forest another day and watch the yellow and black spider remake her web with her weaving dance. After a long day of weaving, the spider is done. She smiles at Karagu and Ameya, then vanishes. The men return to the village with the knowledge of the weaving dance and remake their looms so they can imitate the spider. The new woven cloth that they make is kente cloth. At first, only kings can wear it, but then it becomes a cloth for everyone. Despite the fact that kente cloth is for everyone, it is still highly prized, can be quite expensive, and there are some cloths reserved for the Ashanti king. Part of the reason it is expensive is because making woven kente cloth is a labor-intensive process. The threads must be dyed and woven by hand by specialized male weavers and then sewn into long strips. James Padaglione Jr., writes about how each weaver creates a patchwork appearance through a complex interplay of the warp, the threads pulled left to right during weaving, and weft, threads oriented up and down. In addition, each pattern and color has a specific symbolic meaning. Padalione Jr. states that gold symbolizes status and serenity, yellow fertility, green renewal, blue pure spirit or harmony, red passion, and black union with ancestors or spiritual awareness. Specific combinations of colors and patterns also have further unique meanings related to clans, social status, sexuality, and other things. Some kente designs represent proverbs that reflect the Ashante ethos and worldview. Despite the expense, in her dissertation, Marissa Sakola Tyler discusses interviewing a Ghanaian woman who says of Ghanaian people that if you do not have a lot of money, at least you will have a strip of kente. However, there are other kinds of kente cloth which are less expensive and are made into everything from hats to dish towels. Tyler states that, as an alternative, kente can be purchased as a print. In this case, the fabric is mass-produced in a factory. The design is printed onto a piece of solid-colored woven cloth a standard pattern is used in the print, therefore no alternative print designs are available. Printed kente can be purchased in yards of fabric or can be sold as a ready-made garment. Sometimes you'll see people in the U.S. wearing t-shirts or scarves with printed kente 
to show their pride for Pan-Africanism. But how did Kente get to the U.S.? Fletcher Roberts, writing for the New York Times, notes that Kente was developed by the Asante, a tribal people of south-central Ghana, in the late 17th century, though it has roots in the long tradition of African weaving that dates back to 3000 B.C. Kente came to the attention of most Americans when Kwame Nkrumah, Ghana's first president, wore it at the United Nations nearly four decades ago. Botima Botang writes about how kente and other elements of indigenous culture became important weapons in the symbolic struggle against the legacy of a colonial Europe that tried to erase indigenous culture. She writes, Since 1957, the modern nation-state of Ghana has been the political power in control of the former British colony of Gold Coast, including the remains of the Asante Federation. Unlike Asante, the basis of the Ghanaian state's power over the territory rests less in military and economic might than in its recognition by its neighbors and the larger world community as a sovereign state and a modern nation. Ghana has created a narrative of its origins and culture and has used culture as a unifying strategy in anti-colonial struggle. Botang goes on to write that a similar cultural struggle was waged in the U.S. by the descendants of enslaved Africans. One of the mechanisms used to control slaves was the forbidding of practices associated with Africa. Prime among these were language and religion, but clothing was another side of cultural erasure as slaves were stripped of their African clothing and made to wear crude Western clothing. In the 1960s, radical black nationalists sought to assert their cultural distinctiveness and pride in the face of white cultural hegemony in the U.S., and clothing like dashikis and kente became popular. On both sides of the Atlantic, kente has been used for cultural distinction and nationalism, and its meaning is shaped by everyone from political figures to movie stars to ordinary people. Kente has not lost its power, even though it has been transformed into a commodity. Today, one of the most significant uses for kente in the U.S. is during graduation ceremonies. Pat Leone Jr. writes that an important moment in kente fashion history occurred at Westchester University of Pennsylvania in 1993. Recognizing the need to honor the particular historical and personal struggle of black students to complete a baccalaureate degree, Dr. Franklin Simpson, Jerome Skip Hudson, and Drs. Christian Awuya and C. James Trotman came up with the idea of a kente commencement ceremony. The practice has since spread to hundreds of high schools, colleges, and universities. In the photograph on your screen, you'll see teachers graduating from the Yo Ghana program that unites people from Ghana and the Pacific Northwest in education. The graduates are proudly wearing kente stoles. In addition, Roberts of the New York Times interviewing Doran H. Ross, the director of the Fowler Museum of Cultural History at the University of California, Los Angeles, who has studied Kente for more than two decades, writes, Mr. Ross said that it was increasingly common to see Latino students wearing Kente stoles at graduation ceremonies. Whether the trend merely represented one minority group showing solidarity with another or something more profound, he said, was a matter for further study. Though clearly, he added, the role of kente was expanding beyond the African-American experience. We shouldn't lose sight of the fact that kente is still controversial. In 1992, a lawyer named John T. Harvey III was removed from court for wearing a striped stole made of kente cloth. Saber Chartland, writing for the New York Times, reported that Judge Scott, who is white, gave Mr. Harvey, who is black, a choice, remove the stole, resign from the court-appointed case, or try it before the judge without a jury. Judge Scott dismissed Mr. Harvey from the case. Speaking of the law, we return to the beginning of this podcast and the lawmakers who wore kente stoles in protest of Trump's comments. Despite the fact that Trump made no mention of them, clearly black lawmakers are cognizant of the cultural significance of kente and the power of fighting oppression with cultural artifacts. We can only hope that this will be a renaissance for kente and other artifacts that represent the continued heritage 
of heterogeneity that actually makes every place on earth great. Please enjoy this extra footage provided by Birmingham Museums Trust in the United Kingdom showing Ahigabala Bob Dennis, a master weaver from Ghana, demonstrating how to make kente cloth. Thank you for joining me in this podcast. I hope you learned something new about kente cloth and that you'll want to learn more. Some links are provided in the box below this video.